Let's come back to Ephesians uh, chapter again this afternoon to continue our study of this great epistle. And hopefully to be blessed as we go through these great messages from Paul to the believers of our time. Verse 4 is our lead off verse in our last study period. And uh, we're looking at the word that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We're working on the definition of holiness, and some of you may remember the states given on the Philadelphian church a few years ago, built upon the statement in Desire as Acts Apostles 51, which defines <coughs> just what holiness actually is. And to my mind, one of the finest definitions ever given of this important uh, uh, experience. Can you read it, please? Charlie? Actually, it's not page 51. It's a paragraph all the way It's not conclusive. It is not, a conclu- it is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness is not rapture. It is an entire surrender of the will to God. It is a living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness, as well as in light. It is walking by faith, not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestionable confidence and resting in His love. Thank you. Now let's uh, look more closely at this paragraph, which is a very beautiful paragraph. A very good description of the experience of holiness, what it is. First of all, it is not rapture. What does the word rapture convey to your minds? Ecstasy, excitement. What's that? A secret. Not really. You're talking about a secret rapture? Just a secret rapture, not a rapture. Just airy. That's right. It's being floated off to the seventh heaven, so to speak. It involves excitement. Uh, Activity, this nervous activity, and so on, but it's not that. In fact, uh, more likely it will be quite the opposite from that. Now, note the words here it is an entire surrender to the will of God or submission to God's will, which involves, we've seen, of course, the abandonment of any effort on our part to change God's ways of mind or thoughts. It is living by every word that proceeds the mouth of God and is doing the of the Heavenly Father. Now those three clauses define one, one word, and that is obedience. Living by every word, doing the will of the Heavenly Father, and entire surrender to Him. So first and foremost, to be holy is to be obedient, right? First and foremost. Now of course this word holy is one which frightens people pretty much, and... Uh, they think in terms of something that's beyond our capacity, something that's too much to be claimed. Somewhere here I should have steps to Christ. Maybe I don't. Mm-hmm. What's this one? Mm-hmm. No. Never mind. Uh, yeah. You have one? Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Now, the wonderful chapter called Faith and Acceptance, this is why it talks about holiness as our experience on page 54, it should be, I think. No, it's uh, page 51. Page 51, step to Christ. You cannot change, you can't atone to your past sin, you can't change your heart and make yourself holy. No, you can't do that. And we know we can't do that. But God promised promised to do all this to you through Christ. Now God has promised them to change your heart and make you holy and to atone for your past sins. Both these one works are done by His promise. Now when people are uh, afraid of the word holy, we can refer to that statement which says that God promises to make you holy. Now, when God makes a promise like that, does He mean it? Is it too, is it too much to claim it? Definitely not. We're not, of course, we shan't go around saying, I am holy, will we? Christians don't do that either. But 
we certainly can, by faith, grasp the fact of it and possess the fact of it and be, in fact, holy people. But the second aspect on page 51 of the Acts of the Apostles is, it is trusting God in trial, in the darkness as well as in the light, it is walking by faith and not by sight, it is relying upon God with unquestioning confidence and resting in His love. So that those three or four sentences describe faith, right? Trust or faith or promise in God. So then, those six clauses in that paragraph define what holiness actually is. It is faith and obedience, right? It's faith and obedience. Let's go to Desire of Ages one more time to page 122, 123 rather. No, we can probably stop for me then. It's uh, page 121. When we learn the power of his word, we shall not follow the suggestions of Satan to obtain food to save our lives. Our only question will be, what is God's command and what is promise? Knowingly, we shall obey the one and trust the other. So, basically, living the holy life is to know those two things. What is God's promise and what are his commands? <clears throat> Knowingly, we shall obey the one and trust the other. So therefore knowledge, of course, is a vital part of the whole program. <clears throat> as, as the Old Testament says, you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. What page? One, two, one, Desire of Ages, and 51 in the book Acts of the Apostles. Come back now to Ephesians, the first chapter again. <coughs> So God's purpose will be fulfilled, and we shall be indeed a holy people. Turn to First Thessalonians chapter three and verse three. I further thought in this respect to the text was a great strength to me in the early days of my experience in this message. First Thessalonians chapter three and verse three says, "I will read it." That no one should be shaken by these afflictions. You yourselves know that we are appointed for this. Is that right? First Thessalonians three three. Yes. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Right. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. <clears throat> so, when God's will is such, we can pray with confidence for Him to perform that will in us and to believe it is done. Let's turn the step to Christ again, place 51. In page 51, <coughs> I'll, I'll have this paragraph read, the last main paragraph of the page. Do you, do you have it there this morning? Thank you. Give it a second, please. When we start with Jesus, says, what things do you desire? Jesus says, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Mark 11. There is a condition to this promise that we pray according to the will of God. But it is the will of God to cleanse us from sin, to make us his children, and to enable us to live a holy life. So we may ask for these blessings and believe that we, re we receive them and thank God that we have received them. It is our privilege to go to Jesus and be cleansed and to stand before the law without shame or remorse. There is Therefore, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8 1. Thank you very much. And I think it's most important to understand and to know what God's will is for us. And yes, it's like a list of things we can know for certain. They are one, it is God's will to cleanse us from sin, two, to make us his children. And three, to enable us to live a holy life. So we may ask for these blessings if we have received them and thank God that we have received, have received them. Now, in the book Education, I just want to list a few more things along with that which are worth noticing in our education. <laughs> this is a wonderful chapter called Faith and Prayer, which is why I talked about the true science prayer again in page 253. And I've always been greatly helped by. 
clear promises contained in this particular extract. Once again, since White quotes the verse that uh, we read before from the book of Mark, <coughs> what things are you to sow in your prayer you receive them? Then she says, uh, if we may ask for the thing which is promised, and then we receive it must be used in doing his will. The conditions met the promise is unequivocal. What means the word unequivocal? The, the conditions met the promise is unequivocal. What does it mean? It's absolutely sure. There'll be no equivocation, no argument, no, no question, no doubt. It'll be fulfilled as surely as, as the conditions are met. Either for the pardon of sin, for the Holy Spirit, for a Christ-like temper, for wisdom and strength to do His work, for any gift He's promised, we may ask. There's a little lovely list now of beautiful promises that God offers to us. Pardon of sin, the Holy Spirit, a Christ-like temper, Wisdom, wisdom is meant to do his work. All those things we can ask to all of them are the will of God for us at the present time. Now, living in the, in the very shadow of the latter rain, the knowledge that we can ask for the Holy Spirit is a very comforting one, and we should really ask and ask and ask with great perseverance and importunity. So God's purpose shall be fulfilled in your life and mine as we move down toward the end of time. Now, verse 5, Ephesians chapter 1. Someone read it, please. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Thank you very much. There are two words which are important in this verse are predestination and adoption. What does the word adoption mean? Take it, Joanne. What is not Joanne? Pardon? Say again. Yeah, to be received is right. And we have two kinds of children. We have adopted children and we have begotten children. Now, some folks some have begotten children, some of us have adopted them. When you adopt a child, that child is not born of you, is it? Born of somebody else. If it's begotten of you, it's born of you. Now, a Christian is a child of God through Jesus Christ. But who is the father of the child of God? God or Jesus? Jesus is right. He is our husband and he is also our father. So we are the begotten sons of whom? Jesus. Right, of Christ. We are begotten sons. But whose adopted sons are we? God. God the Father. Right. Now, when a parent takes an adopted child and sometimes mixes them with their own begotten children, a truly loving parent regards each child with equal ardour and affection, don't they? There's no difference made whatsoever. The child himself might make a difference, but the, but the mother or the father do not. They treat that child just like one of their own. So when God adopted us in Jesus Christ, how does he treat us? As his own. In the this morning, the Bible says, seven night, he will love us even as he loves his own son. I hope that when you go away from this camping, that those words will ring in your ears and you'll never forget them. That God loves you as He loved His own Son. So I just played 790. Good, wasn't it? I, I really find it very comforting to know that God loves us to an extent. They come back to predestination again, which has been a difficult subject for some to understand on this, but of course, most out there in the outside world. The word predest predestined means to. To predestiny a person, <laughs> crumbling in his language for a moment. <laughs> Predestine is, is a combination of words, de destiny, which is your fate or future or your, your, your fate, and pre, which means before. So to predetermine what your future is going to be, that's predestination. Let's go back to Romans, I think the 13th chapter is it? Or the 14th, it's in quite anyway, thereabouts. Where Paul talks at quite some length in regard to the matter of uh, predestination in dealing with the experience of Pharaoh of Egypt and in turn the, uh, the Israelites. I just can't pick it up at the moment. You see, we talk about Pharaoh. Back around about 11 or 13. Chapter 9. It is after 9. 9 
verse 17. Oh, it's here, chapter 9 is right. Okay, now have someone read this to me, please, from uh, verses 14 down. Well, perhaps we should go back a little bit to verse 6 and read, first of all, verse 6 to 13 of Romans 9th chapter. Someone got that reference, please? Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a, excuse me, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might, be, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, it's quite important we realize that God does not hate as man hates. Right. No way. What does God hate? The sinner or the sin? He hates the sin, not the sinner. So literally, Esau is a person who is loved by God with no change whatsoever. And so is Jacob, of course, because uh, he made in God's care and service. Now, in these verses, Paul is making a very clear-cut definition between two Israels, physical Israel and spiritual Israel. And the Bible we be sadly misread if we lose sight of the definition of the two. Now has there always been a spiritual Israel? Yes. Who was the first spiritual Israelite? Yes, yeah, I could make further really if you're quite right. Adam. Adam was the first spiritual Israel, wasn't he? And of course the name wasn't used back that, that far back. But the word overcomer was, because what does Israel mean? It means overcomer or victorious one. And was Adam victorious after he repented? No, certainly he was and will be in the kingdom as we know from uh, great controversy. Well, it is to learn too, but it's why that Adam had a very, very sad life and glad to die when the time finally came to get released from his troubles and his distresses. So, Paul then is making the point in Romans chapter 9, verse 6 to 13, that there is Israel and there is Israel. One born by promise and one born after the power of the flesh. Now, this results, this comes close to, of course, with Jacob and Esau because they were, they were twins born of the same mother and the same father and the same conception and birth. And yet, despite the closeness of their physical origin, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, God said. And verse 14, God asks the question, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness? God, certainly not. Now I stress the point here that uh, there are times in the Word of God that appears that God is unrighteous. Does it? I say appears. For instance, when when Moses sat upon the mountain top of Aaron and Aaron either side of him and held his hands up and the Amalekites were then defeated, or he them down they were not defeated, it looks as if God was personally participant in the battle down in the plains below, doesn't it? It looks that way. And if, if God had been personally participant, then he would be a, a destroyer, and there, there we would be what? Unrighteous. And Paul recognizes the fact that God appears to be unrighteous in his dealing with Jacob and Esau. So he says, what shall we say then? And the, the question is, shall we say, is there unrighteousness with God in the answer? Certainly not. Emphatically, decidedly not. God is not unrighteous at any time. In fact, the more I know about God, the more uncompromising it might be. He do all he can. When the need arises, we will never compromise his position for an instant of time in the slightest degree. Okay. 
Well, let's come to the predestination argument that is now come up between verses 15 and 24, please, somebody. 15 and 24. I'll read verse 40 again as well. What shall we say then? Is there no righteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power to thee, and that, thy, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore have ye mercy on whom ye will have mercy, and on whom, on whom ye will be hearkened. What uh, does that mean exactly? Well, we're going to show the first. Thank you. Uh, thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, <coughs> the vessels of wrath, could be the destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now, quite frankly, Paul seems to make the situation even worse, doesn't he? <laughs> yes. He <laughs> seems to. And uh, certainly this appears as if God was, in fact, unrighteous. But Paul presents this argument to show God was not unrighteous. So then, we do have to learn to read this passage, or the, or the story about Pharaoh, and emerge in that reading, also seeing in this the vindication that God is a righteous one, don't we? Let's see if we can do it. Right, now verse 15, he says to Moses, I'll have mercy and I'll have mercy, and compassion and I'll have compassion. Now as you read that, in the light of what we know about man's behaviour, we find apparently God is making arbitrary elective decisions so far as Pharaoh was concerned. And that God personally chose to harden Pharaoh's heart for certain specific purposes that he decided to achieve. Is that, is that, is that, is that what appears? Right. So then, in verse 16, it is not of him who wills, nor him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. I'd like to emphasize the point that Paul keeps saying God shows mercy. Now, verse, 30, uh, verse 17, rather, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, even for this same purpose I have raised you up, that, or is that always indicate? Purpose, of the Intentional purpose. That I might show my power in you, and that, there's another there's purpose again, my name might be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy to me with worlds, and in the worlds he hardens. Now here's a, a picture or an interpretation which could be taken of a conniving, scheming God who says to himself, I need to go down to the earth and to demonstrate my power and to proclaim my name among mankind. To do this, I need to have a very stubborn, obstinate, unbending and yielding power to resist me to the utmost limits, and then my power will be shown and my name proclaimed throughout the length and breadth of the entire world. Is that, is that what Paul seems to be arguing? Does, doesn't he? Which of course is a predestination argument that, that Pharaoh is predestined to be this kind of uh, or stubborn, hard-hearted Pharaoh at this point in time. And uh, when Moses went to Pharaoh, of course, he did find just that as Pharaoh was indeed a very hard-hearted, unyielding, stubborn man who would temporarily repent until the plagues of pardon and he would go right back to his old sinful ways once more. Now. In verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? In other words, if God manipulated Pharaoh and caused him to do what he did, then how can Pharaoh be to blame? God must take the blame. That does seem to be the argument, doesn't it? Let's go back now and consider the whole thing more carefully and uh, find out in what sense predestination ruled in this case.
case. Now, verse 15, God says, I will have mercy to whom I will have mercy. Mercy means forgiveness. Mercy means restoration. Mercy means pardon. It means reinstatement in the family of God. Now, what is the, 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 the deciding factor of who God will have mercy upon? What's the factor? <coughs> In other words, okay, here's Pharaoh, and God has a mercy on him. Here's Moses, God has a mercy upon him. What, what made the difference? One thing. Their choice. That's right, their choice. Now, God had predestined Pharaoh to be a, um, a Christian, to be saved, had he not? And Moses likewise. What is saved, the other isn't saved. Now, what we have to look at, of course, is the fact that whichever way Pharaoh chose, the end result is still the same. God's power is revealed. God's character is also revealed. Let's, let's paint a different picture of what we have in, have in the Bible of Pharaoh. We'll paint from what might have been picture. Let's suppose when that... Uh, I'll go back a little bit, I think, to, the, to make a point here. First of all, let's establish why Pharaoh was so hard-hearted, so stubborn, so resistant of God's pleas and mercies. It was because he'd been exposed to the gospel during the first 40 years of Moses' life when he, when he was in Egypt. And during that time, Moses was the prince and also the heir of power to the throne of Egypt. And as such, of course, he came in contact with the court, the king, the prince, the, the pharaoh, which was the king, of course, the, the queen, and the second in line for the throne, which was the pharaoh who was on the throne when Moses came back from Midian. But during those first 40 years, Moses gave an extremely powerful witness to the gospel. In Patriarch Proverbs, you read how he, how he argued with the priests, or he refused to be absorbed into their culture, into their religious rites and ceremonies. And um, so, during that period, the impact of Moses' life upon the court was, 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 was fairly strong, quite powerful, as a matter of fact, because he was a great man of God, he was right back there. Now, we know, of course, that the court had the choice as to which whether to accept Moses' message or reject it. And what did they obviously do? Rejected it. And when they rejected it, they exercised the rejection muscle, their spiritual rejection muscle. When you exercise a muscle, what happens to it? Strengthens. Becomes stronger. Or the scripture word, of course, is it was hardened. Your muscle becomes harder, and therefore stronger. Now, as um, this is, of course, the young prince who became Moses' replacement would be a very ambitious young man, being, being a boy of the world and wanting to be the king of the entire, entire world. And uh, he cultivated the unchristian graces of ambition, unholy ambition, and so forth. So he became a particularly hard and tough pharaoh. Now, again, I ask the question, by whose choice? His own choice. He could have surrendered to God's will. He could have received God's mercy. He could have been forgiven. But he wasn't forgiven. Very good. Now, when Moses came back, this is what might have been. And Moses took before Pharaoh and cast down the rod and became a servant. And God showed through Moses what was going to happen. Pharaoh could have said, I repent. I choose to repent. And they said to Moses, now, come to my court and teach me in my court how to be a Christian. How to love God, how to obtain mercy. Could he have done that? Could he? Sure. Sure he could have. And then, as a result of Moses' ministry amongst the court of Egypt at the time, the king becomes thoroughly converted and becomes a transformed man, changed in every respect from a proud holy rule to a kind, loving benefactor of his people. And John, we would set the children of Israel free and join with them in the building of God's kingdom upon this earth. Now, would that have been a manifestation of God's power? Would it ever have been? Wonderful. Marvelous. And it's too bad it didn't happen. It's just too bad. Now, would God never be glorified throughout the earth? Absolutely. And his character has certainly been revealed in that wonderful forgiveness because here we find a God who forgave the Egyptians, who was prepared to forgive the Egyptians, even though they had cruelly oppressed his people for several centuries. He was prepared to forgive them completely. That would certainly show his character. Now, when the plagues came, was the character of God shown just the same? Well, it had to be, didn't it? Which 
whichever way a parent decided that God's character would be displayed. Let me give you some examples, for instance, of how God's character was displayed. First of all, God didn't just fall upon the Egyptians and wipe them out, as he might have done. He couldn't have not been destroyed. They came to the Pharaoh and lovingly laid before him the future of Egypt. The rod went down, became a servant, God was up all Pharaoh's servants. And thus God told him that uh, as God's controlling power was removed from the land of Egypt, desolation would follow one after the other. And when you warn a person lovingly and, and comprehensively like that, are you showing mercy? Are you building a fine character? Right. Now, one of the plagues, I forgot which number it was, there was seven or eight, I think it was, was an untimely storm which burst upon the land at the wrong time of the year. Great hailstones, running fire and so forth. And God sent those to tell the Egyptians, to the last man, that this plague was coming, to take your stock inside your barn, to get yourself inside your house and stay inside until the storm is over. Is that a picture of a vindictive God? A loving God, a merciful God. Right. <clears throat> so the simple facts of these that in the predestination of Pharaoh, he was predestined to show forth God's power whichever way he chose to go. If he chose to resist, it'd be that way. If he chose to accept, it'd be this way. Whichever way, God will show his power through the wonderful works of God in the land of Egypt. Which to my mind, of course, demonstrates what predestination is all about, namely that. Uh, we all have the opportunity of being saved. It's only those who apply the provisions given will, will be saved. The rest, of course, will be eternally lost. Mm-hmm. Now, let's come back to verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? Now, can God find fault with Pharaoh's response? Do you? Do you find Paul's Pharaoh's response? Absolutely, it was rejection. It was, rejection. It was a negative uh, response to God's pleas and, and uh, offers of mercy. And therefore, all of Pharaoh mm-hmm. suffered because of being saved from if he chosen to surrender his will, repent of his sin, and come into harmony with God as he might have done. Now, verse 21 Does not the potter have power over the clay? Same lump to make one verse fire and another to dishonor. Now, right here is where you must be careful not to take an illustration too far. Because a clay has no choice at all, does it? Who has the choice? The potter. And who is the potter? God is the potter. So, this picture then would tend to lay the blame to God and make him an arbitrary decider of the fates of mankind. But what Paul is, Paul, and that's going to go, of course, to Paul's illustration. We know, we know this because, because of the text of the Bible. You see, if my arguments are false today, then the text in Matthew, John 3 16 is a false text too, because then we have to read, For God so loved the world he gave, he's only because of that, that what? Who is it except Pharaoh? Yeah. Right, except Pharaoh. Exception. There's no exceptions, are there? No exceptions whatsoever. So therefore, God can make one vessel a vessel to on the other, and the other vessel under this on. But how does God do it? Does he do it as man does it? No. That's the point. He does not do it as man does it. He does not have mercy as man would have mercy. He doesn't, he doesn't elect the love to be one kind of pot or the other as men would do it. Now, in God's way of doing things, <coughs> he sends the sunshine of his love upon the person, and that person then responds either negatively or positively. <laughs> to the works of God in his behalf. And the end result, of course, is the choice of a man, not the choice of God. God's choice is for to be saved and not to be lost at all. So, uh, let's go back to Ephesians, the first chapter again now, to follow, follow through from that point. Right. Yeah. Um, this one is a little point there. Sure. Uh, Paul goes on in Romans to talk about the Gentiles and the Jews and how um, he endured with long suffering the Jews and then the Gentiles were given mercy. It seems to be also a parallel with um, King Saul and David and also with Christ and his kingdom because um, 
very patient with Saul, and yet Saul ended up being a of his wrath and destruction in the sense that he rejected him. David had to wait until um, that wrath was brought to its final end in Saul's own suicide, and then, you know, God had mercy on him in the state of the kingdom, and likewise, Christ has to wait until the, the people who have taken his government or his place on this earth in governments and so on have come to their end and then he receives the dominion over the earth. Right. Where God doesn't force the issue. No. It's, it's you the can one. see it in Saul's case, it was strictly a constant rejection of God. Sure. And also in Pharaoh's case as well, because God waited for the people to destroy the sort of loss of power to hold God's face. And they were back to the at the end. There's no force involved in God's resting his people from Egypt at all. And the last days will be the same. The world's power will be broken completely and will be released and go home with Christ. Very good. Not bad God to talk to us yet. Now let's look at verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, when Christ died upon the cross, how much of the penalty of sin did he bear? All of it. Right? Every last particle of it. But, we can't be blessed or uh, helped by that unless we personally appropriate it, which of course is the entire sanctuary message. In, in Leviticus chapter 4 and chapter 16, for instance, if a man committed a sin, what must he do? He must come to the sanctuary, bring his sin with him, Paying this person, of course, and a sacrificial lamb or go to work as the case may be. Specifically confess the sin over the head of the victim and then kill him. The blood being transferred to the sanctuary symbolizes the transfer of the actual sin from himself to the sanctuary. Now, early in this period, of course, we learned the power acceptable confession. And when I began to teach that message on, on that procedure, I mean, to get very wonderful results in our personal experience and saw sins go for good and never, never come back. So this adoption is available to those who lay hold upon the provision, pass through the correct procedures and have their sins transferred from themselves to the sanctuary. Now there are, as we've learned previously from our sanctuary studies, how many atonements in the sanctuary service? At least four. One at the in the courtyard two in the holy place, three in the most holy place, and four over the scapegoats, four atonements. Now, where do the Protestant churches stop? The first atonement, that's all they ever see. Now, and, and, and therefore they have no ministry in the first atonement, and no ministry in the second atonement, no ministry of the scapegoat. Where did the other church stop today? Where did the world come from? Where did they return? Back to the courtyard. Right? That's all they can say. As so a true child of God recognizes that there are four at least in each of those atonements that must be carried out before we can be finally free from the power of sin and taken down to the kingdom. <coughs> Let's come back now to Ephesians, the first chapter. I greatly appreciate the fact that this predestination is according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6 to the praise of the glory of grace by which he is both accepted in the beloved. And this is fairly straightforward, of course, but the lovely thought is it's all done according to the riches of his grace. Now, first of all, his grace is so rich in itself. Right, it certainly is. Uh, but when you come to the riches of his grace, how can God's grace be richer than it presently is? That's or a statement, isn't it? But obviously it's very rich. It goes beyond its own value. And that increase in value, of course, is due to the impartation of Christ's righteousness upon the scene. And uh, makes it accepted in the Beloved, which of course is God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and even the angel and jolly host. Right. Uh, almost time to stop, so I just sort of end up in the middle of nowhere. Let's just read verse 11 down to verse 14, somebody please. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That 
we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Very good. Let's leave it there. We'll pick up this thing again the next time period. Any questions or thoughts you'd like to ask, Ray? Yes, Eric. Um, I have a question that I've had time for. Um, in chapter, in verse 5, where it talks about the adoption of children, we've understood that to be adoption in the sense of taking a child that is not part of, is part of one family and moving it over to putting it into another home and another family. Okay? Well, another aspect of adoption is simply to place a child into a home where it can have benefits where it could not have in its present situation. Right? Is that also part of adoption? Family. Yeah, in other words, not, let, let's not even look at that. I mean, just the principle of adoption is to take and place a child in a family where it can have benefits potentially that it cannot have where it now exists, whether in an orphanage or an underprivileged home or something. Okay? Well, well, wait a minute. Follow me through here. In Galatians chapter 3 or chapter 4, the word adoption is used again. And it's the same adoption that's used in verse 5. And it's um, chapter 4, verse 5. It says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The word adoption in the Greek means to place. And in this story, you have an heir that is a child. I mean, a child is an heir, but as long as he is a child, he's considered to be as a person under the law, a person in bondage. And as faith comes, as he reaches the fullness of time, as the Spirit of Christ is put into that person, then he becomes placed as a son, reaping the benefits of a son. Now, my question is, is how does that fit in with our understanding of while we're in bondage, we are not part of the family. We move into the family at the birth. When this illustration gives it, as we are a child already, just that we are in bondage under tutors, awaiting for the fullness of time, that we can become benefactors of that that we've always had. I just, I don't understand how we fit them together. Huh? To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. Well, it's pretty clear that we, 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 we are redeemed in order to receive the adoption. Redemption is the end of the record of that verse. Okay. Well, in the in context with that, the 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 whole the study that he's bringing the um, illustration he's bringing out here, starting with verse one, says, "Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all." So his illustration is here: you have a child that is part of the very same family that he's part of when he also receives the adoption. But that as a child, he is under bondage to the elements of the world until the fullness of time has come, which if you read in context with chapter 3 is Christ, which is faith. When that comes, he now receives the adoption of sons, which in this context, according to the Greek, is the place of a son. So he's always a member. This, in this illustration, the child is still a member of the same family. It's just he's not reaping the benefits until he comes to a certain point. The definition is still the qualification. That's the important point. You can't be a member of Christ's family unless you have been redeemed. Okay. Is that potentially, of course? Potentially, every man on the face of the earth can be a member of Christ's family. Every person is predestined to be saved, every single one. No one is saved to the appropriate salvation. Well, what I'm saying is, what I'm trying to grasp here is that are we true? Oh, how do I explain this? In other words, this is giving an example of our already being a member of that family. It's just that we are not reaping the benefits of that family until we reach a certain, reach a certain point in our life. Until that well, time, we're the, as though we're not. Yeah, the, the, the old covenant uh, Christian. <laughs> The old covenant uh, member does reap many of the benefits of the new covenant member. 